Hyderabad in central southern India. Contrasts are everywhere. So little money, yet an incredible richness of spirit. A huge population, yet visitors are welcomed with open arms. I had wanted to visit India all my life, and suddenly here I was to film a documentary about a library. In August of 2000, India had the worst monsoon they had ever known. In Hyderabad, buildings were destroyed, possessions gone, thousands of people homeless. It hit the south of the city like a tidal wave. And in its path was the library, the Sundraya Vinyanya Kendram. There had been no flood warning. Power was cut off and phone lines were down. Hello. But the news did reach one of the trustees Hello. of the library, Dr. Murali. Where are you from? A colleague with a cell phone had waded across the street and discovered that the library was underwater. But the first eyewitness was Sambi Reddy, the secretary of SVK. It was a dry, sunny day, and yet suddenly a wall of water was coming straight towards him. Flood water uh, rushed from north side, and within minutes it uh, inundated the entire uh, SVK compound. Water came up to this level, this up to this step. Uh, every, everywhere it was water, like a sea, uh, the, the water spread all through. In the beginning, I just couldn't believe. It's, it's unthinkable to to think that you know water entering into library and that too till ceiling and the library's what books are floating. The flood flood water rushed through these uh, windows. Within minutes, the water level rose up to the ceiling, and everything was completely submerged in the water. This included the collection of Abdus Samud Khan, one of the world's finest of Urdu, Telugu and English books and periodicals dating from the 17th century. Many were handwritten, irreplaceable, priceless. It's, there is no expression because uh, it is unbelievable shock. I don't know what to do. I mean, actually tears came to my eyes. Sam Reddy was already in tears. How to retrieve, I don't know. And I lost hope also. Um, I thought that there is no way of uh, retrieving these books. Once for all, we lost this entire collection. After receiving the email, it was followed by, well, it was disbelief, and then there was just a gut-wrenching realization that we were in for quite a long haul of agony. My initial sense was one of loss, and uh, I suppose in some ways it was like experiencing a death in the family. I said it is, it is everything is lost. That is, the, all the program, you see, which was based on that, this collection, you see, we thought, well, it, it, it is a hopeless situation. The SVK library was the custodian for the Urdu collection, which had been purchased by a consortium of universities in North America, based in Chicago. With Hyderabad's humidity, the biggest enemy of paper is mold, so the very first advice was to keep the books submerged. And although modern paper, which is coated, distorts immediately when wet, these books were printed on older, vertical weave paper. Also, most India inks were carbon-based, suspended in a gum, and not easily soluble. The books would be safe underwater for another 48 hours, and it was essential to find freezer space first. 
we had that uh, 6,000 cubic feet space uh, for 100,000 rupees per month. That's the rent uh, we paid for that uh, whole storage all along. I, well, I was so much impressed that the girls and boys, they were standing in the water, taking out the books from the dirty water, single-mindedly. And they were handing over the books, and the books, and, and each book traveled through made several hands. And no time was lost. So they were just treating the books like small children. So it was very, uh, very inspiring. But not everyone was as optimistic. I saw Dr. Morali instructing all the volunteers at SVK, uh, including librarian and everyone, uh, instructing them to bring crates with water, running water, bring um, drums, water drums, everything. They could not get what they're doing and what they're able to do with the books floating on the water and uh, uh, solid mud on it also and some books. Mm. I thought it's something crazy to do. The first batch of books went to the freezer three days after the flood and as more books were recovered, more water was pumped out. This water was uh, flood water. It has vegetables, it has sewage water, it has oh, filth, unbelievable filthy water. It was smelling awful. But you know, at that time we never bothered about it. Smell, we never even... We never even felt that there is a foul smell coming. In normal times, you would, you would say, oh no, don't go. Around 300 people, volunteers, worked around the clock and we shifted the books systematically into the cold storage within a record of four days. The consortium created a website, asking first for advice and then for financial help. The news on the internet was seen in Canada by a company that specialised in document restoration. In the morning, my usual routine is to get up, have my coffee, sit down, read my emails, check the headline news and the weather. And this one particular morning, I happened across an interesting headline, which read monsoon flooding in India. And it mentioned wet documents and books, irreplaceable wet documents and books. And she called to say, hey, there's something interesting happening over in India. So that was the first opportunity we had to hear about the flooding. Uh, we learned that the books were actually, uh, in some respect, owned by a consortium of North American libraries. That was interesting as well. And uh, so we decided to try and make contact through, uh, through the, the head of that consortium. And we learned it was James Nye in Chicago. They visited Jim Nye, the chairman of the consortium, and offered a range of possible solutions. However, the best course of action could only be known after a site inspection. It was time for Chicago to make a decision. The advice that we did receive from Library of Congress, from the University of Chicago, from Columbia University, from Harvard, all pointed in the same direction. Cromwell now seemed to be the obvious choice. After numerous follow-up calls and some negotiation, Marshall agreed to send a team without fee for an inspection and Jim Nye agreed to cover the airfares. Their first visit to Hyderabad to see the books was five months after the flood. Yeah, it was like, uh, you know, meeting some angels. <laughs> you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being sentimental, but it was sentimental for us. Sentimental for us because uh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Tears are coming to my eyes. So because uh, here are the two persons who are coming and telling us, look, uh, we'll retrieve your books. Once at SVK, they met Sambi Reddy, the secretary. He took them immediately to the freezer company where the books were stored. First impressions of Hyderabad are of great energy, cheerfulness and optimism. Hyderabad's traffic is hilarious and they drive like madmen. Yet there's never an accident. When they got to the freezer, things were far worse than they expected. The books in deep freeze were safe from further damage. But another 20,000 were in the cooler room at just above freezing point. Mould would have started growing within two days, and this was five months later. Saw for the first time the books that were not even frozen, they were only refrigerated. So much damage had been done. And we weren't sure initially what our success rate would be. It was pretty bad. The books that were sitting at plus two definitely had to be dealt with right away. And the only option that we had at this point, with lack of a freeze dryer in the, in the country here, was to go to an air drying technique. So the compromise solution was to bring all 20,000 to the SVK roof level so that ultraviolet light from sunlight could arrest the mould. The problem then was that the air pollution would attack the paper. The majority of the people in Hyderabad use two cycle engines and everybody drives either a motorcycle or an auto. They do produce quite a bit of pollution. This pollution reverts back onto the books as acid. The Canadians felt that it was possible to save the books. But air drying on the rooftop was a temporary solution at best. Mold and air pollutants had to be counteracted. And for all the books, something radical was needed. One immediate solution was a workshop to show SVK staff how acid and mould could be stabilised. From the centre, out. The workshop was videotaped and a training video was produced for the benefit of volunteers who would join the project in the months ahead. Your mould is only on the outside here. Marshall's report to the consortium was clear. Of the many possible processes Cromwell had for drying documents, the only one suitable under these conditions was thermal vacuum freeze drying. The technology is complex and it's expensive. Not only that, the books would have to be transported to Canada, still in their frozen state, which is also expensive. The only alternative would be to send a portable freeze dryer to India. We knew that if they were going to be able to pull this off, they'd have to uh, do some deep digging, they'd have to find some good corporate support or donations in some manner. Uh, so we weren't surprised really that there was very little reaction initially. These are large blocks of money that we're looking at, relatively small I suppose on scale of international economies, but in the world of libraries, a quarter million dollars uh, to seed this activity is large by any university standards. As it turned out, the Indian government would not allow the books to leave the country. So finally, the only solution was to airlift the machine weighing eight tons to Hyderabad. By that stage, I'd say our depression had pretty well passed over the question of whether we could recover or not. We knew it was possible. And our conviction that it was possible was even further bolstered. It was made 
a firmer conviction by the report that came back from Marshall. Uh, we knew that they were having a lot of challenge uh, paying the monthly freezer rental costs and our, our, our biggest concern was that uh, the, the collection would deteriorate um, and there would no longer be a chance to do what we knew could be done. The monthly rental at the freezer facility was two and a half thousand dollars US. To the SVK, this was a huge amount, month after month, with no end in sight. People started uh, disbelieving us. <laughs> People started saying that you don't get uh, that machine. Uh, you are, uh, you want to hire it from Canada, huh? but is it possible to hire uh, at that exorbitant rate of? Uh, uh, paying $20,000 per month. There's a lot of social pressure is being exercised on us here in Hyderabad. Everybody started telling, oh, you said that you will do it. And your people came in January 2001 and gave a massive workshop. You know, our entire press was here, it's called all over, and then what happened? We said, look, it's coming. It's a question of arranging finances. In the middle of this period, Cromwell became a subsidiary of Belfort International. And to everyone's relief, the new management continued to support the India project. But SVK had to wait over a year for the consortium to raise the funds to use the freeze dryer. It went on for much too long, and anybody will tell you that. In the best of worlds, we would have responded within uh, just a matter of months and initiated this freeze-dryer activity. Quite by surprise, one day, uh, I think Jim phoned, uh, and he was very calm about it to let us know that it was time to go ahead. Of course, he thought it was, he thought it was joking. And I said, great, this is absolutely fabulous. When are we going to do this? He says, 